brief in this case filed by 26 states that are still calling for us to overturn Roe. And when I read that part of the opinion, I wondered to myself two things. One, why is that history relevant? And two, what follows from it? If it's really true that this is an answer to the dissent's objection, if practices long after ratification can give rise to a right, then that means they could have given rise to the abortion right. Which means that if Roe had first come to the court in 1973, but in 1993, when let's suppose most states would have freely liberalized on their own, it seems like Dobbs' logic would be that then there should have been an abortion right. And if you furthermore assume that when the court has pronounced on an issue of constitutional law, that pronouncement should stand, you get the very odd result that whether there will be forevermore a constitutional right to abortion depends on whether a plaintiff first got to the court in 1973 or 1993, which seems like a very strange result. The alternative, and what looked to me like the more coherent path, would be to say that if post-ratification practices matter at all, they can cut in both directions. It's not just a ratchet. It doesn't go in just one direction. So if for a long period of time there's a strong tradition of banning abortions and the court gets to the issue, then it should say there is at this time no abortion right. But if there comes to be a long tradition of protecting abortion rights, then when the court next comes to the issue, seeing the states having liberalized, perhaps even in response to Dobbs itself, then the court, by Dobbs' logic, would say that there's an abortion right, which means that the five justices who gave you Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization would logically be committed to the idea that there could come to be a constitutional abortion right without any change in the constitutional text. And I thought that if the conservative legal movement stood for anything, it stood for the idea that that's not true. If you want abortion access as a right, you have to have an amendment. That was the question that got me launched on the project I'm going to tell you about for the rest of our time together, which I'm calling Living Traditionalism, because I'm looking at cases where the court has relied on traditions, political practices, in particular, the traditional, longstanding, or widespread practices of other governmental actors, presidents, congresses, or states. But living traditions, because they're looking at practices that long post-state ratification. In that respect, they're doing something similar to what living constitutionalists do, which is to look to changing social facts over time. What justifies that? Is it compatible with originalism? And does it have the wonky implications that I just described? Which is that if the court is going to run with these traditions as a basis for constitutional decision, it needs to update constitutional law as our politics change against every originalist instinct. The first question is how widespread is this? I thought maybe this is a fluke. I should also say that in the end, I came to think that the dissent was right, that that part of Dobbs might be detachable, or as the dissent says, window dressing, in which case, while it's crucial to explaining why other rights wouldn't be imperiled by Dobbs, it's not crucial to Dobbs's result. But we can come back to that and the other issues with Dobbs at the end. One question is how widespread is this? Again, as I said, I wondered if it was just a fluke or just a kind of icing on the cake of the uh, decision in Dobbs. And it turns out that that's not true at all. So first, there are recent cases, other cases that are salient, both in the rights context and in what lawyers call structural cases, cases having to do with the relationship of different, different branches of government and between the federal and state governments. In one set of cases, the court will say that because a certain government actor has always done something, there's a long tradition of, the, of this government actor doing it, it's probably within its constitutional powers to do it. An example of that is NLRB versus Noel Canning. This was a case that involved a challenge to agency action under the Obama administration in 2012. Normally, an important check on the president's power to appoint federal officials is that he or she has to get the advice and consent of the Senate. That's not true if the president makes the appointment during a recess of the Senate. But what does recess mean? 
Does it mean the break in between sessions of the Senate, or does it also mean breaks within each session? There were other case, issues involved in the case, but that was one important issue. And on that issue, the Supreme Court said, the president can make recess appointments without Senate consent, even if the break falls during a session of the Senate. And what was the court's reason? Was it that when we look at the text, we see the answer? No, the text is extremely spare. Was it that when we looked at very early history, we looked at Madison's diaries, we looked at the Federalist Papers, we got the answer there? The answer was no. They looked at practice not even within a few decades after ratification, but only for the previous 75 years, mostly 20th century practice. So because that practice exists, we're going to assume that what was happening was lawful. In other cases, the court will say that because a government actor has never before done something, it's not within its power to do it. Probably the most famous Obama-era case of that kind was the Affordable Care Act, NFIB versus Sebelius, the case involving a challenge to Obamacare. One of the questions, as you might remember, was whether it was within Congress's power under the Commerce Clause to mandate that individuals purchase private health insurance. The argument against was that the clause gives Congress the power to regulate commerce between the states, and it doesn't give them the power to compel commerce by forcing a purchase of a product. And while the court ended up upholding the act under a different provision, five justices in that case said Congress does not have the power to mandate a purchase of an item because it has never exercised it. The lack of a longstanding practice, or the longstanding abstinence from doing something, counted as an argument that the government actor lacked the power to do it. In rights cases, the court will often say that because something has long been treated as a right, we'll assume it is a right, even if that treatment of it as a right does not go all the way back to the founding. An important case for our purposes here in a university setting is a set of cases actually that declared, that settled the fact that if you are a professor at a public university, you have free speech rights to protect your academic freedom. You are not simply a government employee, in which case the state or the university would have a lot more power to fire you for what you say. And what was the court's reason? Was it the text? No. Was it the early history? No. It was practices that had developed over the previous decades, in which state universities had given professors this room to make arguments. And for that reason, the court said, it's become a part of our constitutional law. And then, of course, there are cases in the rights setting where the court will say, Something is not a right because it has been banned, and Dobbs is an example of that. All right, so that's zooming out 10 years. You have a few more cases. How widespread is it beyond that? It turns out it's everywhere. It covers every era of the court's history, every area of constitutional law, and justices of every stripe. It covers all three of the articles of the Constitution that define the powers of the president and Congress and the judiciary, Almost all 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights, not the Third Amendment, again, it's quartering soldiers, but every one of the other amendments, and the 14th Amendment, which incorporates, or has been held to incorporate rights against the states. Under Article II, which gives the president his powers or her powers, the court has held not only that the president can make recess appointments during intra-session recesses, but also, for example, has settled the details of the president's power to veto, of the president's power to pardon, of the president's power to get around the high hurdles for treaties by using executive agreements and presidential memoranda and other actions that don't require senator congressional approval to bind third parties, states, international actors. It has used longstanding practice to settle the powers of con Congress, not just with respect to the Interstate Commerce Clause, but with respect to the other branches. For example, Congress's power to limit or curtail the effect of a judicial decision, Congress's power to give judges other jobs, to force Supreme Court justices to ride circuit, to make judges sit on sentencing commissions. And, for example, whether, the con whether Congress needs a, 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 a supermajority of just a quorum or of its whole body to override a presidential veto. It's, involved, it's consulted practice in many states in many cases addressing the federal court's power. Under the rights setting, it has consulted practice not just in the free speech cases I mentioned or in Dobbs, 
but in other cases, establishing the scope of free speech and the scope of the Establishment Clause under the First Amendment, the scope of your powers, of your rights to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment, the definition of seizures under the Fourth Amendment, your right to testify against your, to testify in your own defense under the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, rules against excessive fines and certain kinds of execution under the Seventh and Eighth Amendments, and then under the Fifth and Ninth and Fourteenth Amendments, rights about intimacy, abortion, assisted suicide, parental visitation rights, cohabitation, and many other individual rights claims. Even the the, the right whose 100th anniversary we're celebrating this year, and which has become salient again in public debates, the right to direct the education of your children, decided in Meyer v. Nebraska in 1923, based on a very general and sweeping claim about our longstanding practices. Americans have always seen the importance of directing the education of their own kids, and therefore it's a constitutional right. As I said, it's not just that it spans every era of the court's history in every area of our constitutional law, but originalists are leading the charge. It's not just an afterthought that shows up in Dobbs. It shows up in the originalists of quite general. Just to pick on the namesake for this lecture, Justice Scalia, he was a very prolific author of opinions applying what I'm calling living traditions. In a case called Burson, he decided that uh, you don't have a free speech right to distribute pamphlets outside of an election site on election day because we've long regulated the distribution of pamphlets at that time and place. You don't have a due process right against having a court in another state hail you into it, haul you into its courts as you're just passing through the state because we have a long tradition of allowing states to exercise jurisdiction over you under those circumstances. We do, Congress doesn't have the power to limit the effect of federal court's decisions because it's never exercised that power before the case happened to come to Justice Scalia. Per parents who are biological parents of a child but not married to each other don't have parental visitation rights. This is a case called Michael H. versus Gerald D. because states haven't traditionally given them those rights. Justice Thomas authored probably the most notorious recent living traditionalist decision just two years ago called Bruin, which is the case that decided the scope of your right to carry arms under the Second Amendment and held that you have a right to carry arms and a regulation of that right is unconstitutional unless the government can bear its burden to point to a longstanding regulation that's analogous to the one that it's enforced. So if there isn't a tradition of that regulation, then the regulation is unlawful. Justice Barrett, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Gorsuch, and everyone else who has come close to identifying as originalist has joined one or another of these opinions. Is there an originalist defense? One obvious attempt would be to say that even if practices aren't themselves original meaning, they can be evidence of original meaning. As I said earlier, if the very Congress that gives you an amendment turns around and engages in a practice, that's some evidence that that Congress didn't think that the amendment banned the practice. This is easiest to see in the Establishment Clause cases where, for example, the court will say, because the Congress that gave you the Establishment Clause also opened its sessions with prayer, legislative prayer is constitutional. It's not an establishment of religion. Fine. And I'll give you 20 or 30 years or 40 years after ratification for that kind of argument to work. But there are at least 60 cases, including cases joined by all of the originalist justices, that don't have that structure at all. Cases in which it's very late historical practices that are being cited to inform the details of a constitutional provision. In a case called Houston Community College versus Wilson, Justice Gorsuch cites to determine the scope of the free speech rights of members of public school boards, cites the practices of, of, of public boards 
as recently as 2020. The decision was, was, came down in 2022. And that opinion was joined by everybody. In Chafalo, the Supreme Court determined that even though the founders quite deliberately established the Electoral College to pick presidents rather than a more directly democratic method, states were within their rights under the Constitution to require their electors to vote for whoever the people of the state voted for under pain of financial penalties or maybe even prison. Why? Because our practice, especially in the 20th century, was for the electors to honor the wishes of their states. These are decisions joined in one case by all the originalists and another case by most of them, and that are very hard to understand as attempts to get at the understanding, the original understanding of the text through early practices. Another and more sophisticated attempt is to appeal to the concept of liquidation. James Madison in Federalist 37 said, look, we're giving you a constitution. It's 4,500 words. He didn't mention that part. It's shorter than a JP, okay? And it's, that's before the amendments. Even after the amendments, it's only 7,500 words. So inevitably, there will be ambiguities, and those are going to be clarified or liquidated over time in two ways. One is through judicial precedents, and the other is through a non-judicial analog of precedent that involves political actors. So judicial precedent gets weight because it reflects the judge's attempt after a hashing out of the issues by the parties to get the right answer. And even if you don't think the judge got the right answer, you might defer to their answer in order to strike a balance between getting the law right and having it settled, between the benefits of correctness and stability. And Madison says there's no reason we can't do that with political precedents, too. For example, in deciding whether the National Bank was within Congress's power to charter, Chief Justice Marshall in McCulloch versus Maryland points out that this issue has been debated by political actors. The President and the Congress fought over the issue. They eventually reached a resolution. This was, an issue, this was a debate about what Article I of the Constitution means. And we can defer to their judgment. Deferring to their judgment, to their resolution of that dispute, strikes the right balance between stability and soundness in the same way that deferring to a judicial precedent would. And in many of the cases I'm talking about where the court, especially the originalists, will cite long post-ratification practices, they will appeal to Madison on liquidation. There's one problem with that, which is that almost none of the decisions, all but three of them, have no mention of any debate about the issue, of any effort by any of the actors whose practices we're talking about to face up to the constitutional interpretive question, much less hash it out and then settle on a single answer. And that means that you can't, there's no one whose judgment you are deferring to. Deference to practices that did not come after a debate will not strike the same balance of stability and soundness. And we don't do this in the judicial context either. It's an established principle of stare decisis doctrine that if a court's decision implicitly rules on an issue, but the court did not discuss the issue and the parties did not brief the issue, that decision does not make precedent on the issue. Because maybe, for all we know, if they had hashed it out and attended to the question, they would have reached a different result. By analogy, if you have practices that arose without anything like that kind of debate, in many cases the court itself tells you without any debate, in some cases, the court also tells you, without any awareness on the part of the parties in question, that they were doing something that implicated a particular constitutional question, it doesn't deserve deference. Are there other originalist explanations? One potential explanation is that in some contexts, the very substance of the constitutional provision makes practice relevant. On this argument, the text as originally understood 
though it enshrines a fixed norm, the norm that it enshrines points you to evolving practices. John Stineford at Florida is an originalist who argues that the Eighth Amendment does this, that the Eighth Amendment, properly understood, effectively tells you, don't use punishments that have fallen out of use, even if they fall out of use long after this provision was put in place. Evan Burnick and Randy Barnett and several other originalists argue that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment does the same thing. It says no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, and they tell you privileges or immunities is a moving target. It sweeps in everything that was understood as a privilege or immunity then, but also anything that would come to be understood as a privilege or immunity. Anything that states, enough states for long enough would treat as a right becomes a federal right under the Privileges or Immunities Clause. This is an available argument in some areas. It's not one that the court has made in any of these areas. But it's a possibility for some cases. Another argument for relying on these post-ratification traditions, even if they're not evidence of original understanding because they don't come early enough, even if they're not precedent-like liquidation because they don't reflect the outcome of a debate, even if they are not made relevant by the substance of the particular provision you're talking about, is basically a Burkean or Hayekian argument. We have now exited the realm of specifically originalist argument and of, indeed of legal argument. This is simply an, the, the suggestion that if we've long done something a certain way, it's probably smart to stick with it. Burke would spell that out in terms of the accumulated wisdom of many minds over many ages. Hayek would put it in quasi-evolutionary terms. If the practice has stuck, it's probably expedient. There's probably a good reason that it's stuck around. It's probably serving a purpose. And if we upend it now, we will not. Uh, we, it may bring unforeseen consequences. That's a political moral argument. It's a policy argument in a pure enough form that originalists have not helped themselves to it very much. I think the real reason that this is an appealing method is that it's the closest thing for an originalist where original meaning has run out. It's the closest thing in terms of achieving the original goals of originalism. Originalism as a movement, as a self-conscious legal movement, arose, as Keith Whittington of Princeton tells us, to achieve a number of goals. Number one was to push back against the Warren and Berger courts, which had been understood by people who led the movement for originalism to have departed wildly from the Constitution, understood in any purely legal sense, to achieve progressive policy goals. So this was a kind of rational account of why and how to push back against those precedents. Second, and relatedly, it was a way of tying judges' hands so that new judges don't repeat the errors of the Warren and Berger court. Specifically, so that new judges don't impose their own policy and value judgments using their Article III power and insulation from elections. And third, and also closely relatedly, it was seen as an expression of popular sovereignty. The idea that the real authorities in our constitutional system are the people, that they act through electorally accountable actors and through ratification. So if you are a judge exercising power, you need to trace that power either to a statute or to the ratification era understanding of a constitutional provision. What if the original understanding of the provision runs out because, as Madison tells us, the language is spare? What's the next best thing? If you, if you lean back on precedents, you're going to be leaning back on Warren and Berger port, court precedents that, that you think were wrong. If you lean back on your own best judgment of what makes sense, you're repeating the Warren and Berger court sins of, as the originalists put it, judicial policymaking. So practices, traditions, give you a somewhat more external standard to decide cases in the name of something that looks like a legal criterion, and moreover, a criterion that is supplied by the people and their elected representatives. 
We're talking about the practices of presidents and congresses and states, and all the things those three have in common is that they are, what all three have in common is that they're accountable to the people. So where original meaning can achieve the, the goals of originalism, traditions do. Is that it? Does that mean that we're off scot-free? Does that basically silence the anxieties about originalism and by originalists about the use of these traditions and methods? I don't think so because of what I ended with about Dobbs, which is that I think on reflection, no matter what rationale for relying on these traditions you lean on, it will have the implication, the startling to an originalist implication, that the living constitutionalists have one thing right. There is one set of cases where we have to update constitutional law to keep up with the times. Not just anything about the times, not just evolving generalized feelings and beliefs and so on, but to keep up with political practices to keep up with practices that are expressed by the ongoing and repeated actions of elected presidents, of elected congresses, and of elected state officials. In Dobbs, for example, if, as I mentioned, there's a movement perhaps in reaction to Dobbs itself to, to radically and strongly and robustly protect access to abortion, and if you take that part of Dobbs' opinion that I mentioned earlier as essential to its judgment, you would have to say, that by Dobbs' logic, in 2052, it might turn out that there's an abortion right under the Constitution. In the gun setting, soon after Bruin, the decision in which Justice Thomas struck down the, Justice Thomas for the Supreme Court, uh, held invalid, New York regulation saying you needed a very special reason to carry guns in public, New York went back to the books and said, well, the Supreme Court has told us that we are allowed to regulate in sensitive sites. We are allowed to prevent carrying in sensitive sites because there's a long-standing practice of allowing regulations in sensitive sites. And so we are just going to expand our list of sensitive sites to include not just schools and courthouses, but basically every area of public gathering. In the context in which I said that Justice Scalia, writing for the court in Michael H. versus Gerald D., decided that parental visitation rights will depend on the practices surrounding family and parenting that have prevailed as states recognize new family structures. If those practices change, then the, pra then the parental visitation rights themselves will change. In the free speech setting, where I told you that the Supreme Court has said that university free speech rights, the free speech rights of public university professors depend on the fact that we have long recognized those rights. If the practices change, then so should the right. I think, as I said, that that follows from any of the rationales given for relying on tradition. If tradition matters because the positive law, the very substance of the provision we're talking about, the Eighth Amendment or whatever, makes those practices relevant, then there's no reason they shouldn't make practices relevant on an ongoing basis. So when the practices point one way, the law goes in that direction, and when the practices point in the other direction, the law should change. If you take a Burkean or Hayekian basis for caring about political practices, I think the same thing follows. Both of those theories are basically theories on which traditions are evidence. Maybe they're evidence of what people think the law meant, which is evidence of what it is. Or maybe they're evidence of what practices work. But if new traditions start to take hold, and they take hold for long enough, then we have counter evidence. And if they take hold for long enough, then we have counter evidence that outweighs the original evidence. And so the Hayekian and Burkean argument for caring about traditions would tell you to change the law that was based on those traditions. And the democratic impulse that motivates originalists to look to political practices when original meaning isn't clear equally tells in favor of changing the law based on those practices when the practices change. If it's in the name of democracy that Justice Alito is telling us, look, the people have tied my hands. We have an unenumerated right. We do recognize those, but we peg them to the people's practices, and we look around and the people's practices are that there is no constitutional abortion right, 
then the very same democratic rationale obviously will require the opposite conclusion when enough states for long enough have recognized an abortion right. And obviously there's a lot of vagueness in that. The vagueness is there partly because the court, not having been very self-conscious about this, what I'm calling the living traditionalist method, has not spelled out in great detail what kinds of practices count for any given provision. But as it's becoming more self-conscious about its method in general and about its use of traditions in particular, that could change. The final thought you might have is, well, look, this is a nice academic exercise. Maybe this paper will help you get tenure. But it's not of any practical relevance, because a longstanding practice, almost by definition, is unlikely to change. I mean, it's been there for long enough. The Hayekian in you will tell you it's probably going to keep going. There's some kind of inertia to traditions. So even if, in principle, originalists are committing themselves to the idea that the practices should change, or that the law should change when the practices do, this isn't going to come back to bite them because it, the practices won't change. And I, th I have a combination of answers to this point. The first is that you'd be surprised. And in fact, there are cases, there are examples in the living traditionalist case law of very long-standing practices changing. The recess appointments case I told you about, Noel Canning, for 130 years, no president, with two exceptions, with the exception of, I think, one president twice in one year, had ever attempted a recess appointment of the kind that was at issue there. And then, all of a sudden, they were pervasive for 75 years. In a case called Myers, which dealt with the president's power to remove executive officials without interference from the Senate or Congress, so the flip side of the power to appoint without interference, a very important case, a very important means of presidential consolidation of power over the federal bureaucracy. In that case, the court itself had to admit that after the 60 or 70 years in which the practice went one way, which is that the president has more or less unilateral authority, we had another 60 years of the practice cutting the other way. Sometimes you even get a massive change in practice in the teeth of a contrary precedent. In 1972, in Furman, the Supreme Court said, effectively declared the death penalty unconstitutional for all purposes, based in part on changes in practice. It noted that the number of executions in recent years had fallen to almost zero. It extrapolated from this what it called the national consensus against the death penalty. And then applying the Eighth Amendment, it said that the death penalty is unconstitutional in practically speaking in general. Practice has changed very quickly. Congress and 35 states immediately passed laws beefing up their provisions of the death penalty for various crimes. And four years later, the court came back and said, well, practice spoke once, practice is given, practice is taken away. So we have to reinstate the death penalty. Now, there are technical ways of trying to square those two decisions at a finer grain, but the gestalt impression is very much one of practices cutting in different directions, and again, in the teeth of a contrary precedent. And I think, in general, that there are many soft power and hard power means for presidents and congresses and state officials to express or manifest their resistance to a traditionalist Supreme Court decision in ways that the Supreme Court, by its own logic, can and should take account of when it next visits an issue. So in the end, I have mixed feelings about living traditionalism. I think that on the one hand, in some cases, it seems pretty close to inevitable because of what Madison told us, which is that the text despair, plus the fact that in many cases you don't have any record of debate about the issue by previous actors, and it's very hard to think of what's better to go by than the practices that seem to have arisen for whatever reason. I also think that they have this implication that cuts against originalist instincts, that also cuts against the kinds of rule of law instincts that lead to not just originalism, but its close cousins. And I don't see a way out of that dilemma. 
So it may be inevitable, it may be extremely attractive for the kinds of reasons that make originalism attractive to begin with, and it may have this very surprising counter-originalist instinct implication. It's a testament to the court, in a way, that this kind of internal critique, if it succeeds at all, is possible. Because the court, in my view, has gotten it closer to right than any court in my lifetime so far and likely in the future. And it has gotten, it has attempted, it has been, in my view, conscientious about trying to get the law right in ever more self-conscious and self-aware ways. It's showing its work. It's telling you its moves. It's making them explicit enough that you can critique them by their own rationales. One way or another, the law, in principle, then, should be working itself pure. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Girgis. So uh, we're going to open the floor in a minute. We have a couple of uh, mic runners, but let me um, uh, exercise the privileges of the chair and just uh, ask an opening uh, question. Sure. Um, what this is all about, it seems to me, is when are judges justified in displacing the judgments of the people acting either directly through referenda or initiative where those are authorized or through their representatives? And why do we worry about that at all? Well, it seems to me there, there are two reasons. One, because we care about being ruled by law. We care about the rule of law. And two, we care about Republican government. Government not only of the people and for the people, but government by the people. So we worry that if unelected and electorally unaccountable people get to displace the judgments of the people acting through their elected representatives or acting directly through referendum initiative, if we allow that, we will basically give up on the rule of law and undermine Republican government. So when are we justified as judges, or when are judges justified in displacing the judgments of the people? Well, the answer typically is, when the Constitution requires it. And have you ever met a judge, liberal, conservative, left, right, Republican, Democrat, ever once? Now, you can name me a legal theorist, but you think, I think you can't name me a judge who ever said, you know, I voted to displace the judgment of the people here because I thought the people, damn them, were wrong. Maybe Posner. Yes, or twice. Yes. <laughs> Other than that, no. Other than, but he only admitted it after he was retired. That's right. yeah. um, no, they always want to say, the Constitution made me do it. So there's got to be something that is to be distinguished from the Constitution. And relying on that something is what violates the rule of law and the principle of Republican government. So that's something we could characterize as what? Acting on one's own political or philosophical or religious one's normative preferences or one's normative judgments. All the judges across the board and most legal theorists say, no, they can't do that. They've got to be relying on something else. So what are the candidates? Well, where the text itself is clear, the text. Provisions of the text have logical, often have logical implications and logical presuppositions. Well, you gotta, you're stuck with the logic, right? So the logic, the text, the logic. Sometimes the structure of the Constitution, its provisions or its sections or the structure of the institutions that are established by the Constitution and operate under the Constitution give you some guidance and enable a plausible argument to be made that what the legislature has done here really does violate the Constitution. The Constitution made me do it. And then the fourth, of course, is the original meaning or the historical uh, understanding. Where in any of that would we place tradition? Or is tradition something 
independent of those four categories I mentioned. Text, logic, structure, historical, understanding. And why, if it is some separate thing, why would defenders of the rule of law and Republican government need it? Why not just throw it overboard? The only time you can displace the judgments of the elected representatives of the people are when you're required to do so by the text, the logic, the structure, or the historical understanding of the Constitution. Good. Okay, so if the, if the project is interesting, the answer is it's none of those things. That it's an, its own uh, criterion of interpretation, of decision in these cases. Um, but now the question is, well, what difference does it make? And which is related to the question of why rely on it at all. And I think the closest analog, because we're talking about the longstanding practices of political actors, the closest analog criterion of interpretation would just be what used to be called Thayerianism. Basically, a strong presumption in favor of the permissibility of whatever the politically accountable actors are doing. Thayer was a 19th century law professor. Right. Yeah. So, um, so, so one, one way to force this question of what difference it makes and why it's worth accepting that difference if it is, is to say, how does it differ from Thayer? Thayer, you can imagine the argument for that approach. We're in a democratic republic. We're in a liberal republic, a liberal constitutional order, which means that everything needs to be either the call of the majority or the call of the supermajority that's supposed to trump day-to-day -day majorities. And if you can't trace your coercive action to either of those things, you're overstepping as a judge. And so if you can't clearly identify a higher norm in the Constitution that trumps the everyday majorities, you defer to the everyday majorities that pick the president, that pick the lawmakers, that pick the state actors, and so on. I think there's basically two sets of cases where Thayer and living traditionalism, what I'm calling living traditionalism, would come apart. They'd reach the same result in the cases where the court says, because a politically accountable actor has always done this, it's probably OK because there you're deferring to what the actor has done. They reach the same result in the cases that say, because states have always banned this, it's not a right. They reach different results when the court says, because the politically actor has never done this before, it's not allowed to do it now. So when, when Congress uh, passes the individual mandate as part of the Affordable Care Act, and again, the court found a different way to uphold it, but just looking at the commerce power, the court says, ah, Court, Congress has never tried to mandate purchases of products under the commerce power, therefore it's beyond the con commerce power. Obviously Thayer would say, look, if you can't clearly say it's forbidden by the Constitution, you've got to defer to the politically accountable actor, which is Congress. And then in the right setting, cases where the court says, because we've never regulated something before, it's a right. And so you can't regulate it now. Because would you point there to... Myra against Nebraska and Pierce against Society of Sisters? Yes, so those are the cases identifying the right to direct the education of your uh, kids and invalidating uh, attempts to ban the teaching of German in the one case, and right? attending, and private, attending religious private religious schools in the other. Um, and there you're obviously not deferring to the politically accountable actor, but overriding them. Good. Floor is open. Jonathan's got a microphone over here, and does someone else? Yeah, Christy's got one over there. Uh, someone says, oh, yes, uh, David Tubbs. Uh, David is precepting in constitutional interpretation, professor at the King's University, at King's College in New York. Uh, thank you. That was very stimulating. And I wanted to press you a little bit. Are you, it seems that you, in the end, have misgivings, but maybe it's thorough dissatisfaction with Justice Scalia's criterion for establishing unenumerated rights under the Constitution, rights deeply rooted in the history and tradition of the nation. Uh, how deep is your disaffection? Is it, is it, uh, is it outright opposition at this point? But, okay, so this is, um, this is the case, this is the criterion. Is it deeply rooted in our history and traditions that and my, I say this on the basis of what you said about Dobbs. Okay, right, that's, that, that, that my boss used in Dobbs, my old boss, wasn't, wasn't my boss at the time, I wouldn't be talking about it if he were. And, that, uh, and, that the, and, and there he was just applying precedent, which is a case called Glucksburg that said that you don't have a right to assisted suicide because 
for 800 years of Anglo-American law, assisted suicide or assistance of suicide has been banned. And that was a 9-0 decision. That was a unanimous decision. Um, okay, so am I dissatisfied with it? I have some misgivings, but all things considered, I think it's the best approach. The one question I have is whether you should look to practices at the time or also later. On that question, I'm ag at the time of ratification or almost so later. On that question, I'm agnostic because I don't, I haven't developed a view about the debates about the best understanding of privileges or immunities. So there are the scholars I mentioned who say that it's a moving target. It's as originally understood, it's a fixed norm that points to changing practices. So it tells you to be a living traditionalist. Well, if the law tells you to do it, you should do it. So, um, if, but if they're wrong about that, then maybe the best default or maybe the right reading of the text would make the ratification error practices relevant. But, bracketing the question about timing, do I like practices, if we're gonna have judges recognize unenumerated rights, do I want them to go by practices or do I want them to go by something else and I, I want them to go by practice? And practices as reflected in the way that Dobbs and Glucksburg and lots of Eighth Amendment cases and so on. Look, which is not just, not, you're, not, you're not commissioning polls. You're not looking at sort of practices in, in, in very general or uh, undefined senses. You're looking at the actions of political actors, the kind of things you can look up if you have a Westlaw password as a lawyer, right? You can look at statutes, you can look at regulations, you can even look at enforcement practices of executive officials. That's what happens a lot of, in a lot of Eighth Amendment cases. And why? Because I think that's the least bad thing as far as judicial competence and authority goes. Um, judges are bad at figuring out what the social trends are. I mean, they, you know, they can, the justices can, can go months without stepping outside their homes. Now, these days they do that because of intense security mm -hmm. problems. But you know, they can be driven from their home into the garage under the Supreme Court and go up in an elevator that's not accessible to the public. Again, I'm not blaming them for that. That's, that's what current conditions have effectively required. But the point is they're not in close touch with the people. Even if they were, it would be anecdotal evidence, obviously. Um, and if they're not trying to go through some touchstone other than their own judgments, then uh, other than their, uh, the, the political practices of the people, they're gonna revert to their own judgments. Now, there are lots of cases where figuring out what the traditional practice is will require an exercise of discretion and maybe even an exercise of normative judgments of some kind. You need to figure out what level of specificity or generality to describe the practice at. And that might involve an irreducible element of choice. But the question is a comparative one. Is that less illegitimate, less, giving less reign to the judge's prerogatives and predilections, or even you know, objective normative, normative judgments, but theirs over ours, uh, than the alternative proposals? And the best way to focus the question, if you resist that, is to think about what you would rather have them do in Dobbs. The dissent says, and, and another way to focus that is to ask what the dissent said they should have done in Dobbs. Because the dissent obviously thinks Roe got it right, uh, or that they should have held that Roe got it right, as well as that Roe should be in place because of stare decisis. So the dissent says, first of all, well, if you're looking at practices in 1868, that's a time when women didn't have political power. But then the dissent concedes that the result wouldn't have changed if women had political power, because as the dissent sort of awkwardly puts it, women at the time may have had a foreshortened view of their own rights. So then the dissent says, you gotta look to the full sweep of our history. And the majority replies with the passage I told you about. What full sweep? We looked all the way up to the year that Roe was decided. Practices were still overwhelmingly against. Even today, even in the year that Dobbs, the, the day that Dobbs was decided, the public opinion gap in abortion, on abortion, the public opinion gap between the sexes on abortion was smaller than it is on almost any other issue of public life. So even today, something close to as many women as men, and some polls more women than men, roughly as many women as uh, su su support uh, abortion restrictions as the opposite. Um, so if you're not gonna have, if, if you want Justice Alito to say that Roe is rightly decided, but not based on practices in 1868, not based on practices in 1973, not based on beliefs in 1868 or 1973 or even 2022, what are you gonna have him go by? The, the best 
alternative account is a kind of line of best fit across the privacy precedents, right? The, the precedents about other aspects of bodily integrity. But even then, as the dissent also admits, you have to weigh them against the, what the dissent admits is some kind of state or public interest in fetal life. So you're really forcing, the farther away you move from practices, the more you force the court into making its own weighing of the goods of fetal and maternal interest. And while 15 years ago, that would have sounded like a polemical point by an originalist against the Warren and Burger courts, today it sounds like a more bipartisan point because today it's Justice Alito balancing the interests and not Justice Burger or Justice Warren. Other questions? Uh, yes, uh, Professor Tarr. In thinking about tradition and practice, are those the same thing? Uh, we, have a, we had a longstanding practice of segregation in schools uh, in a number of states. The people had favored that. Uh, at what point do we say, nonetheless, this is not our tradition? Right, so there's at least three elements to that. One is, what sorts of action or conduct count? And there are threshold conditions. The action in question has to be by the right figures. The, the entity that's claiming the constitutional power or the entity that governs whether something is a right for you or not under state law. Um, number two, the action has to be numerous enough. In some settings, that means it has to have lasted for a long enough time. In other settings, that means enough states have to have treated it as a right. Uh, in Eighth Amendment cases, the court will say, well, we'll start to treat something as an unlawful punishment as, le as long as the trend is in that direction, even if it's not yet a majority of the states. Um, but over and above that, and another element to your question is, it's not enough that it be a practice. We have a practice of speeding through yellow lights, but that doesn't make it a tradition worthy of any kind of deference or you know, of any positive normative significance. So it needs to be not just a practice, but something that's seen as proper in some sense. In the Eighth Amendment setting, it's a spreading practice of abandoning a punishment because it's cruel. In the privileges or immunities, 14th Amendment setting, unenumerated rights, it's the practice of not regulating conduct, not because it hasn't occurred to us or because we don't feel like it or because it's a matter of taste or because we have other priorities, but because it's special and to be protected. And then the third possible thread to your question which I'm picking up on because of the segregation example, is are there areas where practice doesn't cut it? No matter how long-standing, no matter how widespread, no matter how normatively backboned it might be. And there's one area where I have found Supreme Court opinions saying practice cannot be relevant, and that's in the Equal Protection Clause. There are a couple Justice Kennedy opinions saying when it comes to the Equal Protection Clause, he doesn't quite put it this way, but the gist of it is, its very purpose is to interrogate our practices, to figure out if they're rational or justified. So you can't cite practice in an argument defending practice. That would be circular for purposes of the Equal Protection Clause. Interestingly enough, there are other settings where the court has relied on practice in the Equal Protection setting. So the, the companion case to Glucksburg is a case called Vacco versus Quill, which is and in that case, in both cases, the court was faced, among other things, with the question of whether it's rational or whether it's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause for a state to say, you can't assist suicide because that's intentional killing, but you can withdraw life-saving medical treatments because that's non-intentional killing. And the court said, look, we're not philosophers, but we are going to defer to the rationality of that practice and therefore say it's not an arbitrary distinction, so it's not a violation of equal protection because our law has long drawn the, the, the distinction. Because in torts and criminal law and all these other settings, executives and lawmakers and common law judges over the centuries have thought there was significance, moral significance, to this distinction. So that practice gives us a reason to defer and to think there is some significance. So it's not entirely obvious how to square the cases saying we will consider practice in equal protection and the cases saying we won't, but that's the one setting where I have seen cases saying they won't. And that would obviously apply 
to uh, the racial segregation in schools that would have been used to justify uh, holding on to Plessy against Brown, uh, as against Brown. Professor Rosen, uh, uh, microphone, uh, Christy will give it to you. I'm wondering if you have a sense from your reading of the cases that the appeal tra to tradition really is functioning as a constraint against judicial discretion. Are there cases where, to the extent that we can gauge this, courts are saying, we decide, as we do, because history and tradition requires it, but this is deciding against our own policy preferences or our, against our own sense of what would, in fact, be wise. Because the material is so flexible and the standard is so vague that, like many of these constraints, it can function as a cloak for discretion rather than a hedge against it. So are you saying, in my judgment, are there cases where it has, in fact, cut, led them to a conclusion their, their policy preferences oppose? Yeah. How often does it happen? Yeah. Um, Scalia and Johnson and Eichmann. Yeah, I'm trying to think of whether that was a case where practices were, were really driving the... Well, historical understanding. Yeah, so I mean, so right. The, the, there are several cases where Justice Scalia seemed to reach a result that was clearly oh, contrary those are to the his flag burning. I should yeah, yeah I just Texas versus those. Johnson. So there's a case where the court Justice Scalia said, "I hate this. I hate the hippies who do this." But if you want to burn a flag, the First Amendment protects your right to do that. Um, and so he's going against his normative judgments and preferences. Same thing in a bunch of criminal procedure cases. For for the most part, those are not cases where. The, the court was citing practice as the determining factor. I, I suppose, so look, several of the justices who joined the, you know, Glucksburg was 9-0, and I assume that it's not a unanimous court thinking that assisted suicide should be regulated. Uh, I assume some of them thought that there, there probably should be a right to it. Stephen said that he did. Right. Um, but I can't think of other cases offhand, and... Uh, yeah, so uh, on, the we on whether it is a constraint. So let's suppose that going forward, they said, we read living traditionalism, and uh, we are now fully convinced that it's the right approach, but we're going to make it even more articulate, and now you can really, you can really hold our feet to the fire because of that. Um, when will and won't it make a difference? I think it will make a difference in those cases where the practices are pretty monolithic. And I think Glucksburg was a case like that. Apparently, the unanimous Supreme Court agreed. I think Lux, Dobbs was a case like that. And obviously, there's disagreement about that. Um, so where are there cases where it's harder to say? I think the area today that's most salient, where it's very hard to say, is the gun case is the gun setting. And this is because of things that Justice Thomas admits, to his credit, in the majority opinion for the court. He says, you know, am I telling you you need a dead ringer for the regulation today, in, deep in our history, to say that the regulation's okay? No, because circumstances change. We have guns today that we didn't then. We have uh, urban clustering today that we didn't then. And so there might be a new need for regulations. But at the very least, you should find a re regulation that's analogous. And what does analogous mean? Analogous means that it strikes the same balance of burden to benefit, of burden on the ability to defend yourself as compared to benefit in terms of lives saved. But already now, we're not quite telling the judge to adopt his or her own preferred balance of burden to benefit, but we're requiring the judge to make an assessment of both of those factors and then compare the ratio of them in the one setting to the ratio that was struck by some historic regulation. And that's going to be the, the far extreme from what I'm identifying as the relatively uh, cleaner cut analysis of Glucksberg and Dobbs. Oh, uh, yes, there's a question uh, right up there. Uh, Christy, uh, can you bring the mic up? Thank you very much. So um, you mentioned that the crucial case in which um, this new kind of jurisprudence will differ from previous models of 
just deference to the majority will be when it's denying certain powers that the legislature, the executive, haven't utilized up to this point. But um, in the decisions that you mentioned specifically, I guess it comes to mind that the decisions the court made could be theoretically motivated by other more originalist considerations, the kind of which Professor um, George was mentioning. For example, in um, the case on Obamacare, obviously the distinction between compelling commerce or regulating it, or uh, you mentioned how this um, whole paragraph was, is not even considered by some to be crucial to the decision in Dobbs. So my question, um, it concerns how do we know that tradition is the key motivating factor and it's not simply obiter dicta in service of a consideration and a judgment that's premised on fundamentally different considerations? Excellent question. So sometimes I think it's clear that the tradition really is just icing on the cake. Sometimes the court will say something like, and tradition here confirms what our other criteria suggest. Chief Justice Marshall, when he's citing the liquidation practices that I was talking about about the National Bank, says, having told you I'm deferring to these political actors, don't get me wrong. I think this is right as a matter of first principles also, and let me tell you why. Um, there are some cases where the court is unclear, where it doesn't disambiguate the, the, the factor of pra early practices as evidence of original meaning as opposed to later practice as its own independent criterion. For example, in, the, in many free speech cases, the court will say, Obscenity is not covered speech because it has long been regulated from the founding to today. But it tells, doesn't tell you whether it's the founding part that really matters or the, or the other stuff is doing work. Uh, similar in, similar, there's a similar issue in the Establishment Clause cases. But I think there are many cases where practice is basically the only thing the courts got. There's a case, just to take a trivial example, there's a case called Garamendi, which is about whether it's within the president's power to use executive agreements rather than treaties to bind third parties in other countries who are foreign corporations rather than powers. You can stare at Article 2 all day long. You can stare at all the precedents all day long. And they just won't speak to that question in any meaningful way. And so the court sheepishly admits, we're using the practice to justify the practice. Um, and I think in the rights cases in particular, because to the extent that there has been a rationale in the cases, it seems to be this more constitutivist argument. It's not just that practices are evidence of what rights you have. They're the thing that make it the case that you have a certain right or don't have a right. To, to avoid talking about practices would be to change the subject. It would be to, by your own lights, ignore the ground of the answer to the question of whether you have a right or not. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, Professor Johnson. I, I, one thing I would say is that uh, the rate of change of tradition is accelerating so that um, the way in which, you know, new ways of doing things become accepted, the rate at which that's happening is accelerating for all sorts of social reasons, economic reasons. And so I wonder uh, that there's some uh, acceleration, <laughs> A, where your view pretty much collapses into the living constitution view. And I have the sense we're not too far away from that rate of acceleration, where talk of tradition is like, um, you know, and this is teaching uh, undergraduates for many, many years. Um, they're changing faster, and what they take to be a settled way of viewing things changes faster. And so, uh, given this acceleration, the indeterminacies that uh, Professor Rosen was emphasizing just get bigger and bigger, and uh, judges using your very appealing criteria will just have many, many opportunities to insert their particular moral and political views, wittingly or unwittingly. OK, I, I agree in general. So there are some potential breaks on the process. They would require, among other things, that the court get clear about which practices count and why and how. 
So in Meyer, as I mentioned, the court just has this gorgeous generality. The American people have always known that you know, the right to direct the education of your kids is yours. End of story. Obviously, something that vague and indeterminate is ripe for the kind of uh, a convergence with whatever you think is right as the Constitution that you're describing. In the settings where they require specific kinds of governmental action, there will be at least some friction from the difficulty and transaction costs and veto gates and so on that make government action hard. And in fact, today, along with the kind of acceleration you're talking about, there's increasing gridlock. And so that could be a, a, a limiting factor. So for example, if the court says, all right, fine, uh, there is a constitutional abortion right, but it takes, uh, sorry, there could come to be a constitutional abortion right under the federal constitution if enough states protect it. But the state's protection needs to take the form, needs to take concrete form. There needs to be statutes saying, this is so important, we're going to fund it, we're going to do this and that for it. Or uh, there needs to be state constitutional provisions that say this is so important that the legislature tomorrow can't just take it away from you. And those things take time and have costs and have come in fits and starts and go forward and come backward and so on. So there would be some limiting factor just from that. Um, but the, the, the one area, the one tradi living traditional-ish uh, element of constitutional law that doesn't make reference to governmental action as such, or at least one of a of, of small handful, um, there's a case on uh, the city of East Cleveland, the cohabitation case, the case that says, today we, you know, people cohabit in all kinds of forms, therefore there's a constitutional right to it. That's, that's looking at the behavior of private actors. Um, but, but another is, again, in the gun setting. So the, Heller, the, the first big case defining the Second Amendment uh, right to keep and bear arms as an individual right for the sake of self-defense, says that the rights that you, that the guns that are covered by the right are whatever guns are in common use today. On the theory that the right is for the purpose of self-defense, so you have to be able to equal the guns that your, uh, that your assailant um, is likely to be using. And that's obviously a thing that could change quite fast based on market dynamics that don't have to pass through governmental action at all. Sharif, where the text is clear on its face, are there any circumstances in which, from a living traditionalist point of view, the text can nevertheless be ignored because of the tradition? No. In every one of the cases I've found where the court is relying on practice, it has either overtly or covertly said the text isn't clear by itself. Okay. So if the text has priority over tradition, would the same be true if you successfully established the original meaning, the publicly understood meaning of a constitutional guarantee or provision or protection, would it ever be trumpable by tradition, for a living traditionalist? The cases I'm thinking of that say, of course, because the text is unclear, we're going to be, we're, we're allowed to start looking elsewhere, seem to treat those things as uh, the same. So the text either on its face to us sitting here today as good Anglophone readers, or the text as originally understood. Okay. So as you know, in Dobbs, a couple of professors submitted an amicus curiae brief in which they uh, dumped an avalanche of historical evidence on the court to show that the term person, or that the provision in the Constitution that uh, in the 14th Amendment, section one, that says that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, uh, included if we look at the legal materials, statutes, cases, horn books, the medical materials, including medical texts, the writings of 19th century feminists on the topic and so forth, included uh, the unborn, included uh, human beings at all stages of the development from the embryonic through. This was during the period when the common law prohibitions of abortion were being significantly strengthened after dis the discovery of the mammalian ovum and the birth of modern embryology by von Baer in 1826. Let's say that a, a, a justice was convinced by that and said, that's true. Could that same justice, if he or she were a living, con a living traditionalist, say, that's true, but it doesn't matter because we now have this new tradition? No. And that's for two reasons. One is that, as I mentioned, the, the cases all um, 
either outright say we're allowed to consult traditions here because the text or the original meaning isn't clear enough or are at least consistent with that general rule of thumb. Um, and also because of what we were saying earlier about the Equal Protection Clause. I mean, the professors in question, if I remember right, think that what's, what's giving uh, fetal life, unborn life, constitutional protection is equal protection and not just any old provision of the Constitution. And that's one setting, at least, where the court has sometimes, at least, said that, uh, that um, the clause stands in judgment over our traditions. Mm -hmm. Other uh, questions? Uh, Professor Jackson. <clears throat> Is this compatible with your view, or maybe even a clarification of it? When the text, when the constitutional text is not clear, then we look at traditions and practices as epistemic and merely suggestive. And indeed, not as to whether there is a right, but as to whether there should be or should not be a right. That epistemic signal then could be sent to state legislatures, Congress, even movements for constitutional amendments without overriding the originalist impulse, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. So if should be or should not be means that not that the judge should recognize one or not recognize one, but that the people should enact one or not, then yes, that's all fine. So this would just be not a theory about judging in particular, but a kind of Burkean or Hayekian theory about political morality and about legislation, which is that you should, you know, you should look around at things that practices that have stuck and give them legal effect and legal form and legal insulation where you think for whatever reasons that those practices reflect the wisdom, the accumulated wisdom of many different minds over time. That's all consistent with this in part because it's not, a, it's not on the same plane. It's not a theory about how judges should, should do their job. Yeah. Um, but does it not obviate the tension that you were so concerned about um, it gives practice and tradition some place epistemic again, uh, but without dispositive force that you do then rely on the Congress. I guess I was thinking, I was understand, as I was understanding the question, it's giving them an epistemic role. It's, it's treating them as evidence of information relevant to lawmakers, not of information relevant to judges. And so, yes, it does, it, it gets around the tension entirely by simply not having judges be living traditionalists. There is a question about whether it's evidence even of a very weak kind for judges as well, because you could say, look, okay, fine. You know, the president and Congress, they, they, they back their way into this settlement, this set of practices, but they never had the debate. So it's not liquidation in your Madisonian sense. Isn't it still worth something? I think the answer is yes, but just a little tiny bit. I mean, it's true that the fact that this practice took hold, you know, you can assume, if you can assume that a significant number of the people who engaged in the practice are conscientious and intelligent and of goodwill and legally informed, then you can assume that some significant number of them adverted to the question of whether this was legal and only stuck with the practice because they judged that it was legal. But it doesn't feel like very strong evidence given that we don't do the same thing when we think about judging, as I mentioned. There, it's a much more controlled environment. The judge's job is to just think about legal questions and issues and decide according to them. And yet, when the judge didn't advert to a question, even if it was implicitly decided by their decision, we don't give that decision any significant weight. There's one other very general kind of weak way, I think, that, that living traditionalism, of, that the tradition of living traditionalist judging can justify itself, which is that if you take a certain kind of positivist view about our law of interpretation, so there are some theorists who say, and Professor Rosen has written this in, in some legal settings, uh, Professors Bode and Sachs have given this as a positive argument for originalism. They say, look, just like there's, a there's positive law about what to do at yellow lights and stop signs and about not killing people and not punching people, there's also positive law, albeit customary, about what to do when you're a judge faced with a legal text. And they think that our positive law of interpretation, customary though it is, imposes some kind of somewhat thinner sort of originalism. But one of them, Will Bode, after reading the paper and discussing it at a conference, said, well, look, our 
positive customary law of interpretation, as you've just confirmed for us, also says that when the text is unclear, practices, even if they didn't follow a debate, even if they're not liquidation or precedent-like, get some weight. So the very fact that this is so widely practiced, and not just widely practiced, but self-consciously practiced, and without shame practiced, indicates if you think courts' practices themselves constitute the positive law of interpretation, that this is a kosher form of interpretation. Um, I'm sure some of the women in the room have good questions, and I do hope you'll raise your hands and let me recognize you. Uh, No, okay. Uh, I think there was a question over there. Was it Ben? Oh, you, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, a couple of years ago, there was one case in particular that I think really drew a larger public attention to the use of tradition, especially the use of actions by political actors in the constitutional system to kind of understand their own authority in the constitutional system. And that was the second impeachment trial of Donald Trump, in which he had already. Been, he was already out of office, and so the Senate was continuing with an impeachment inquiry, or an inquiry, a, a trial against the president, uh, for whom the, the the major remedy of impeachment could no longer apply, which was removal from office. They were trying to say that, oh no, we can still maintain the second prong of that in the Constitution, which is disqualification to hold future office. Chief Justice Roberts didn't preside over it, which he never gave official comment as to why, but there's, to your point about un understanding, oh, well, maybe the Chief Justice didn't think this was constitutional, but in the instances in which it's really purely political processes like impeachment, or I'm even thinking of the use of presidential pardon, where the framers took these legal concepts from kind of English law and then transplanted them into a Republican form of government, are there instances in which these really kind of mostly non-judiciable cases can have weight on how constitutional powers are viewed when let's say, uh, in the course of the debate over the second Trump impeachment, the Congressional Research Service and a lot of other people put forth evidence of, here are instances in English history where the impeachment power was used to try and go after people who had already resigned from office. This happened in late 19th century with, um, I think it was 1880s, there was a case of this. What happens then when the judiciary doesn't have any input historically, but yet the political branches are kind of, in, an, in a cynical way, in my cynical view, are kind of eking out a certain amount of power not necessarily given to them under the logic of what I thought the impeachment clause was, and how do the courts go about understanding that? Let's say, for instance, Trump had been removed from office and disqualified, and now wanting to run again later, he tries to bring a, a lawsuit. How did those kind of more political realms work? Good. Here? There was a stage at which I thought my whole paper was preempted by something Keith Whittington published a long time ago. Uh, so I got very stressed out. And <laughs> I uh, looked at the book and was greatly relieved to realize that he was, in fact, talking about a whole bunch of important cases that were settled by appeal to post-ratification practices that weren't simply evidence of original meaning, but they were entirely outside the judiciary. They were exactly of the sort that you're talking about, where in an impeachment, so there were several impeachment trials that were examples of his uh, in the book. I think it's his constitutional construction book. I don't remember yeah. what it's called. Uh, maybe it's called constitutional construction. And um, I think that's the highest and best use of living traditionalism. Uh, it's the thing that the, that the executive branch does when it's making law for itself or when it's making its own legal determinations. There's a whole office of legal counsel whose whole job in the Justice Department is to try to interpret the Constitution for purposes of executive action to guide the president's choices when there is no judicial precedent. And in every one of those memos that's been released, because they're not always released, um, the main form of authority, aside from judicial precedent, is past practice. So I think that that's a very natural uh, use of it, and it only becomes living traditionalism when, for some reason, a particular instance of this becomes justiciable and ends up in court. And in those cases, I think the practices should get the same weight that they get that I think they should get in these other settings. It's uh, said by historians that George Washington, when he assumed the presidency, was keenly aware that everything he did was establishing uh, a precedent. And some of those things, it seems to me, do rise to a kind of constitutional status. But of course, they're, 
not uh, questions that arise in the context of judicial review or questions about the, the, the separation of powers between the judiciary and the executive or anything yeah, like ju that. Yeah, just uh, my, my other con law professor, Akhil Lamar at Yale, has a book called The Un America's Unwritten Constitution where he thinks there are constitutional norms that aren't clearly derived from the text. Yeah. And he has a whole chapter on the George Washington canon, which is basically, if Washington did it, it has constitutional status. Don't ask any questions. <laughs> and, and I think that there's, um, I'm happy to make a carve out for, yeah. for Washington. Uh, one last question, just up here, yes, uh, you sir. Yeah. Uh, well, I was, I was pointing to the person in front, but we can do two if they're quick. Um, you you asked a question. Uh, you were answering a question earlier about tradition and practice, and uh, you mentioned that the third condition was about um, what is proper. So I just had like a quick question of how, in that context, is what is proper or what is moral or right determined? This is the least theorized and developed part of the doctrine because it almost doesn't occur to the court that it has to ask this separate question that's not simply about statistical frequencies, but about expectations of the actors in question. Um, it's very obviously salient uh, to me in the rights setting. So no state has ever banned the consumption of vanilla ice cream, but that doesn't mean there's a constitutional right to vanilla ice cream because the reasons it hasn't banned them has not been the assumption that there's a right. Um, so when most states have not massively regulated your ability to direct the education of your kids, what makes that different if it is different? It's except in the Eighth Amendment setting where the court tries to look for indications that the executives or the juries that are acquitting you or the executives that are not applying a sentence or whatever think that it's a bad sentence to impose. The court hasn't really adverted to the question. And I think it would, the answer would take different forms based on the area of law and the kinds of practices that constitute that doc, the doctrine in that area. And finally, Professor Breen. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your, your presentation and I appreciate your, your mixed feelings about uh, living uh, traditionalism uh, because it seems to me, and the reason it seems to me is that so, when it comes to tradition, so much depends upon the level of abstraction with which it's articulated, with it's defined, and uh, the way in which it's framed. And so much of the, law the lawyer's art is framing issues, uh, which involve normative judgments. Um, Maybe there's less of that that's involved when it comes to state powers. Um, but when it comes to individual rights, it seems like it's really the heart of the matter. And I just point to the, the two cases that the dissent really has in mind in, um, in Dobbs. Uh, at least I think the two cases it had most has in mind, which is Obergefell, one which you're very familiar with, and, and, and Griswold. Uh, and Obergefell, I mean, just there in terms of how it's framed, is it, well, does the state is there a tradition about the state saying who you can marry? Uh, yes, but it's narrow, and we've already rejected part of that in the past when it comes to race. Um, or is it really about, is really the tradition about defining marriage? Uh, and it seems to me that that's really makes this not uh, uh, attractive going forward. I feel you. <laughs> I was told to give a short answer. That's my, I, so I agree, and I think this question uh, is one sentence, maybe a semicolon. I agree that the, I think that the question of how to define the practice, whose propriety and longevity and widespreadness or not we're trying to judge, is insoluble and endemic to these cases, and is a kind of ineliminable problem with their application and obstacle to the evaluation of this method is simply superior to the alternatives without any drawbacks. Well, uh, one wonderful thing about longevity in academia is that a guy like me who's been at this, I'm entering my 39th year, uh, would be blessed with the opportunity to welcome back uh, a beloved uh, student and to hear him give such an impressive presentation and respond uh, so directly and with no dodging uh, to such excellent questions. So please join me in thanking Sharif Jeeves. <laughs>